our heads for a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Holy Spirit, and we call you down right now to rest upon us in the name of Jesus. We beckon you, Holy Spirit. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to rain down on us. We need you always. We need you now. Move through us right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, right on my tongue, Lord God, right on our hearts, Lord Jesus right on our minds, Heavenly Father, everything that you want transcribed, Lord Jesus. Let us remember your word, Heavenly Father, and have it, let it be customized as always, Father, for those who will see this, Lord Jesus, in whatever uh, way that they see it, be it here, be it on YouTube, be it on Facebook, wherever it is, Lord God, let it penetrate hearts, Lord Jesus Christ, and let them know, Heavenly Father, those that don't know, and let those be reminded who have forgotten, Lord, or need reassurance, Lord, that you are a merciful God, that you are a great God, that you are graceful, Heavenly Father, that you are gracious, Lord Jesus, that you're omnipotent and omniscient, Heavenly Father, that you are everything that we need you to be, Lord Jesus, and you are the one who gives us comfort at all times. You are the God of peace for us, Lord Jesus. You are a banner that gives us victory, Lord God, and we bless your name today and always, Father. We just ask now, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, that you allow your Holy Spirit to move as he wants and know, Lord Jesus, that we don't hinder the Spirit, that we are so open, Lord God, to whatever you want for us in our individual and collective lives, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you, we adore you, we lift you up, we edify you, Lord God, we love you and respect you you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. So this is going to be more, well, you all know, I, I, I'm more of a teacher than just a preacher anyway. So this is more in the form of one of our Tamiyan Bible studies, which is appropriate. Um, our Tamiyan studies are, are, are the Bible studies that are just more personal. Amen. They they beg questions that we don't always speak, but we keep inside. And this is one of those um, teachings for today. So since I've been in ministry, and I know this is true for, has to be true for most, if not all ministers, there are questions that come up over and over and over again. Um, common questions, but like I said, questions that people don't necessarily want to ask in church or speak about um, all the time. And so what we're going to speak about today is one of those questions that typically come up for me and have come up for me throughout the years from couples who are facing presumably, presumably um, difficult pregnancies or have experienced the loss of a child or have experienced um, the loss of a child either in its infancy or as a young child or even in miscarriage. Um, another group that asked the same question, it comes up from parents and other family members who have people near them or even friends near them who are mentally challenged and who suffer mental illnesses. And that question is, if these babies or these young children or these persons with mental illnesses die, will they go to heaven? Amen. Will they go to heaven not having accepted Christ in the way that we accept Christ? And it comes up always. Now, it's a real concern, obviously, and it's a taxing question, right? Because it's something that we do think about from time to time. And sometimes we don't ask the questions that we want to ask because we perceive it as I'm doubting God or it's something I should know or it's something that'll breed, breed um, a lack of faith. And that's not what it is at all. But these are questions that can wear on our emotional well-being. It can wear on our spiritual well-beings. And it can really bring us down if we don't get these answers. Amen. And if we don't get them thoroughly and scripturally. So in times past, I've always had these discussions um, in counseling sessions or just in private conversations with the family members um, of these people who I call um, vulnerable individuals, or as the Bible calls them, innocents, 
but I was led today, um, like God is doing, he's just doing some different stuff in my life right now. And he's got me really coming out and addressing things that I've not addressed publicly before. And that's, and I know I'm not the only one. And that tells me that God is doing a big thing, a new thing, and there's going to be a wave, amen, of evangelism and a huge open door as always, but even wider to accepting Christ and to coming into the kingdom. Amen. And I appreciate that. And I love the Lord always, but I love him even more for what I, I feel he's doing. So I was led for the first time to actually share this teaching publicly. Amen. So bear with me. I'm going to do it um, in a more annotated fashion, obviously, you know, because we have our, our um, time here. Um, but I do believe I can get it all out in a way that it wraps it up for people here and for people who will see it and in a way that we have enough that we can go take to others who may have the same question. So it's my prayer that it will reach those who have had this question and it will provide some form of closure for all of them and for any of us who have ever uh, experienced ourselves or have had family or have had friends with these same concerns. Amen. So to start, I want to open up to a very common, um, familiar verse, and that is in Romans 10, 9, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And it says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. So when we're speaking of those infants, or we're speaking of those young children, or we're speaking of those individuals who are mentally challenged, those who are unable to understand this concept that's laid forth in Romans 10 and 9, um, or they're unable to carry out the charge that's given to us in Romans 10 and 9, those who can't comprehend the gospel message itself, right? It begs the question, are they held accountable? Are they held accountable for this if they don't comprehend it, if they don't completely understand it? Can the wages of sin be imputed upon them? Amen? We have to take a look at a few things. Now, we've had in the past some very dogmatic preaching, some very dogmatic messages from other preachers where it's strictly fire and brimstone and that's it. The wages of sin is death. Um, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and they put a period at the end of it and it does not cover all bases. It just does not. We have to understand we serve a loving God. We serve a gentle God who's coming back as the judge. Amen. He's coming back that way. But right now we are living in his grace and we're living in his mercy. So we've got to take a look at a few things and look at the word for what it is. It says um, that it says to speak with your mouth, to confess with your mouth and believe in, in your heart. That's where the accountability comes in. But to be accountable for something, right? And this is just an everyday occurrence. Think about your children at home. Um, think about the laws of the land. To be accountable for something, you have to know it, right? You have to know what it is and you have to understand it. So to be accountable for a thing, we have to first know it and we have to first comprehend the difference between right and wrong. That's in its simplest form that I'm making it very, very simple here. We then have to take that further and be able to discern good from evil, God from the enemy, God from the devil, right? As a child would say it, there's God and there's the devil, right? We have to be able to really understand and discern those two things. And we have that basic understanding, then we're better able to comprehend that rebelling against God is sin. When we rebel against him, it's sin. And we better have to comprehend that we and God are different. When we get that concept, we can better comprehend that we and God are different completely, right? That we are the sinners and that he is perfect, that he's not on our same level. And that's a trick of the enemy that he has tried to pass down generation after generation after generation, where he tries to tell people that we are equal to God. And they even try to take scripture and do that. You know, they take that God is in us to say that we are God. And that's just not true. We have to understand the difference between us and the difference between God. God is perfect in all his being, in all his works, in everything he does. He's perfect. 
and we simply are not. When we get that, then we can understand that he loves us so much that he sent Christ to take the punishment for our sins. Amen? Once we can make some sense of these concepts, even at an elementary, uncomplicated level, then and only then can we carry out the mandates of Romans 10, 9. It's at that point that we can carry out those mandates. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. In other words, it's then that a person is able to willfully accept or reject. We've got to be able to differentiate, right? We've got to accept or reject God's provision, his forgiveness, his authority, and then ultimate salvation. So clearly on a surface level, babies, very young children, and those individuals with certain mental challenges are incapable of this kind of conception. Now, this is not to say that we know all things and we know what goes on when God is, is uh, relating directly to his children. There can be a lot going on there. It's the same thing when we talk about, you know, people who are not saved and at that moment of death, oh my goodness, they're just gone. We don't know what happens at that last moment. None of us have any points of reference for that. God can go to them. We don't know what goes on. They can give their lives in that last moment that we know nothing about, right? It's the same here. We don't know if God talks to his children, connects with his children, and the light that shines inside of us connects. We don't know that. But base, just basic scripture is what I'm dealing with here, okay? So they are not able, they are, are, are fully incapable of that kind of, of understanding, that kind of reasoning. Why do I include the mentally challenged here? This is something that um, I've talked about with a few people through the years. It's because we have some diagnosed illnesses, some diagnosed mental incapacities where the doctors have been able to, and other specialists has, have been able to say, okay, well, this person is at a certain age. For instance, I have a cousin who is 70, almost 70 years old now, which I can't even believe, <laughs> but she's almost 71, but she's always had a very, very elementary um, level of maturity, level of understanding. She has, uh, she's functioning. And so on the surface, until she begins to speak, you would not know that there was a lot going on mentally. Okay, that there were a lot of mental challenges. But very soon thereafter, when you began to converse with her, you realize, okay, there's something happening here. Well, she's, although 70, almost 71 years old, she's at a level where she's about, about five or six years old mentally. Okay, she cannot live on her own. They tried years and years ago um, the the assisted living and that, and it did it just didn't work because she's not there. There's some things that you think she can do um, and be functional. When Trinity goes near her, she gets so excited because she feels like she well even now Trinity's almost a little bit old, you know, for her. But they it was when she was maybe four or five years old, or she gets so excited because it was almost like she had a playmate and they watched the same TV shows and um, try to do their nails together and, you know, nail polish is all over the place and that kind of thing. And so she's just not at that level. So conceptually, can she be held accountable for understanding the all that encompasses the gospel message, all that encompasses Romans 10, 9? So she's at that same level of immaturity or the level of being a child. And there are many people who have these mental incapacities or these mental challenges that are at different levels and they're just not able to um, fully comprehend these concepts that we spoke about, forgiveness and authority and provision and salvation. And they cannot consciously accept or reject God in his totality. So that's why I include the, the mentally ill in, the, in these groups. And so it's, understandable then that they're incapable of being held responsible for the imputation of sin in their lives. Now, when we look at another verse, you can jot this down, um, but I'm going to go to 2 Samuel 12, 23. 2 Samuel 12, 23. And this is where we talk about um, David and David and Bathsheba had lost an infant child. 
in that in that story. And it reads, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? This is David speaking. But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So David felt here that he would be with his son again in the afterlife. He felt that and he would he would not have written this down. He would not record it, have recorded this if he didn't fully believe that. And he believed that based on the oral traditions and the oral teachings that came down um, from the likes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the forefathers. This is the oral tradition that was passed down. This is the oral tradition that David was um, privy to, that he was exposed to. He understood that concept of paradise, right? He understood that there was an afterlife. And this was not the only thing that was taught back then. They didn't just teach paradise. They also taught that there would have been a place of distress. There would have been a place of affliction for those that didn't know God and didn't obey his law. And that would have been Hades, okay? Or as we call it sometimes, the belly of the well. And it's obvious that he wasn't referencing that place. He was talking about a place of peace and a place of comfort. He was comforted, comforted by the thought that he would be with his son in what was known um, in Luke 17, or Luke 16, I think it is, I'm sorry, that it is called uh, Abraham's bosom. He was going to be in that place, and that's when he would see him. His son wasn't coming back to him, but he would be with him on that day that he goes over to paradise as well. Then he goes on in the next uh, verse or so, and he comforts Bathsheba, his wife, with that same sentiment. So now I'm going to jump over to Numbers um, chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Okay. And in 14, um, we have to remember what was happening here. Of course, prior to this, God had freed the slaves from Egypt. He, he freed them from Egyptian captivity. And then they rebelled, as always, right? <laughs> There was always that rebellion. So if we jump to 14 and verse 29, Numbers 14, verse 29, and it says, in this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you 20 years old or more who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. 30 says, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hands to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun, okay? So in this verse, in verse 29, God tells the rebels what their fate is going to be, but he makes it very clear that the judgment in the form of death would come to the adults and not the children. Now he uses the number 20. He uses the age of 20. That's the age that God gave at that time. We have some misconceptions about ages in, in the word. We hear people talking about the age of accountability and it being 20 or it being 18 or it being 12. This is not a concept that God has given. There's not an age of accountability. So I don't want to get that mix, mixed up here, okay? It, it, it's more of a... Um, a sense of accountability or a, a, a level of accountability. There's no age of accountability. It's your own individual understanding, okay? So now let's stay in numbers and jump over to chapter 16, number 16, and I'm going to read verse 32. 1632 says, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them with their households and all of Korah's men and all their possessions. And then if you jump to Numbers 26, verses 10 and 11, Numbers 26, or number, Numbers 26, yeah, verses 10 and 11. And give me just a moment to get there. Okay. And it says, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them along with Korah, whose followers died with the fire, devoured 250 men. And they served as a warning sign. The line of Korah, however, did not die out. Okay, so in number 1632, it talks about the men and their families. And then in numbers 26, 10 and 11, it tells us the children of Korah did not die. So again, the adults were held accountable not these children. 
for something that they did not understand, something that they did not do. Now I want to jump over to the book of Deuteronomy, okay, right after Numbers, and I'm going to start in chapter 1 and just read verse 39, chapter 1, and I'm going to just read 39, and it says, and the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to them and they will take possession of it. So once again, they weren't held responsible, these children, because they did not understand. Our God is a merciful God. Our God is not a God who sets us up for failure and sets us up to say, oh, I got them now. This one doesn't understand. I'm going to throw him into the lake of fire. That's not God. God went so far as to send his son, his beloved son, Jesus Christ, to the world, to the earth, to be to, to suffer, um, to be humiliated, to be beaten, to be scourged, to ultimately be crucified and give his life so that his children, adult and not, would not suffer and would not have to have the same fate. So if he did that to the if he did this for the adults, what more would he do for his children that we know he loves? He says, "Suffer the little children to come unto me." He loves these children. He loves the innocents, young children, the babies, those with mental illnesses. Again, I have to say it over and over again. They're not able to fully grasp the knowledge of God and His law. They cannot do it. They're unable to fully grasp the concept of sin. So if we jump then over to um, Romans 20, 3 and 20, Romans 3 and 20, it tells us that God's law shows people clearly that they have done wrong things. It shows people, the law tells us what we've done wrong, but we cannot be saved by our right doing. We can't be saved by knowing the law. We can only be saved by God's grace by the blood of Jesus. So if they don't get the concept of the law, then they don't fully know what sin is or the implication of that said sin. So the vulnerable innocents that we're talking about here are still born with a sin nature. We don't want to get that twisted either, okay? They're still born with that sin nature like all of us due to the sins of Adam and Eve, but their measure of liability is vastly different. So the bottom line is that those who have a guileless and incomplete understanding of the gospel message based on what we know of God's character, based on his word, the word that he's given us, they will in fact rest with him. They will in fact rest with Christ. And we give God all the great praise and we give him all the honor and we give him all the glory for this kind of grace because it just shows us once again that he is a loving God who will never, ever, ever fail us. He says, surely grace and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And just like it follows us, that grace and that mercy, my dad used to call them those twins, grace and mercy. Grace and mercy not only follows those children and follows those miscarried babies and follows those infants and follows those who are uh, who have those mental challenges, but embraces them, encompasses them, engulfs them, and allows them to be able to rest in Abraham's bosom, paradise, heaven, whatever you want to call it. Amen. And I do hope this brings comfort to those who are watching, those who may have struggled with this for years and years and years. I hope it brings some kind of closure. It brings some kind of peace to know that our God is a loving God and his love has not changed from age to age to age. It's still the same. Amen.